All right, don't be frightened. <laughs> I have a visual here. This is a complicated visual that actually layers on meiosis and independent assortment with a Punnett square plus P traits. Now, the only thing that makes me sad about this diagram well, okay, there's two things that make me sad, and I will be very quiet about my sadness because I'm much more grateful than sad because this it's awesome that this human, Lady of Hats, yes, Lady of Hats, it's awesome that they set up this image for us and threw it out to the public domain for everyone to use. The things that are a little challenging about this diagram, number one, the symbols are totally different than what we've been using. Number two, I feel like there's a weird, um, um, I, I think there's a dominant and recessive discrepancy in what this diagram says is dominant around pod shape compared to um, what we talked about being dominant in pod shape. This would be, okay, I have, I have words to say before we tackle this. This is an example of analyze I would never give you this and then go ha ha this actually isn't the correct um, dominant and recessive for pod puffiness um, I wouldn't give you that I would give you this and say what's going on here and then you'd go oh well it looks like they are saying that crunched pods crinkled pods are dominant to uncrinkled to puffy pods see that this is how I know because the big Y is dominant. And look here, this yellow one is shows a crinkled pod with homozygous dominant Y. So the point is that they are saying something different in this diagram, but you can go with it. Like, who cares? We're not memorizing P qualities. We're practicing heredity traits. So the two traits that we're going to look at are color and crinkledness. That means that we actually are gonna deal with two pairs of homologous chromosomes and look up there carefully. You can see that independent assortment is how we end up with more possible gametes than what you might, you might just be like, dude, a R and an R done. But depending on how those homologs line up on the metaphase plate we already know that that's independent assortment depending on how that happens we get more possible gametes than you might think okay so i really like this because we see our heterozygous genotypes of both parents yes we see the possible alignments notice in the left hand alignment we have all blue on one side and all red on the other. And in the right hand alignment, we have a blue and a red on each side. So I, again, I really like this because now we can see that when we do, when meiosis happens and anaphase separates the chromosomes, we end up with one possible gamete that has all blue chromosomes one that has all red, one that has half blue and red, and one that has the other half blue and red. Do you follow how independent assortment means that we can mix and match our gametes? Now, <clears throat> I don't know, we have to go through meiosis two. This right here, we, we are in meiosis one, <clears throat> and we have to go through meiosis two, but the results of meiosis two are gonna be the same as the results of meiosis one, with the exception that we're not talking about crossing over in here. So we're not even thinking about that whole phenomenon. We're just looking at the ind independent chromosomes themselves. So where they show down here, they show the two products of, you know, the sisters split in meiosis two, and now we have two haploid gametes <clears throat> from that one cell. They have the same possible genotype in the gamete. And we end up with four, uh, 
possible gametes. If I gave you, if I just like, if we didn't even look at this and we're like, okay, how many, if this is my genotype for a parent, heterozygous for two traits, how many possible gametes can we produce? You're gonna say, you could go through meiosis, you could. And I'm kind of surprised that I don't have to. I don't have to visualize meiosis to do this. I can visualize meiosis to convince myself that I'm right. This is how, this is why we end up with this many gametes. But I just look at that parent genotype and then I say, okay, possible gametes. What are all the possibilities that I can have? Well, I could have a big R. Only one big R and a big Y, or I could have a big R and a little Y. When you only have two genes, it's easier. If you had like 10 genes, then they were all heterozygous and you had to go through and methodically come up with how many possible gametes, you're, you might have some troubles. But with just two genes to keep track of, it's pretty methodical. I then go. I could have a little r and a big Y, or a little r and a little Y. There they are, my four possible gametes. I'll make that a square sperm for fun. <laughs> That's it, guys. That's all you have to do to determine your possible gametes. But do you agree that we got those because we went through meiosis? And do you agree? that we got those because of independent assortment. And that's the piece that old boy Mendel was like, dude, I think that they can like line up somehow and separate independently of each other when we're dealing with two traits. Home kids, indeed. Okay, I'm gonna leave this and we're gonna go and do our own dye hybrid cross. Remember, a monohybrid cross had one heterozygous trait that we crossed. If we have two heterozygous traits, like big R, little r times big R, oh my gosh, little r, what? Nobody knows what I just said. I just drew it. So watch my actions, not my words. <laughs> Whatever, that's the dihybrid cross, and I wanna take us away and do it ourselves on a clean sheet of paper and go through our four steps so that we do the whole thing ourselves. Okay, dihybrid cross coming at ya.